Um, mayors, you know, particularly in the age of social media, have to operate in kind of what, what I call two time zones. Um, there's the immediate and the long range. And most citizens operate really in the immediate. You know, I'm being evicted. My street has potholes. Uh, these new taxes suck. Um, the nice old house next to me is getting torn down. Uh, a whole host of things. But mayors, you know, really great mayors have to really operate in the other time zone, the long range time zone, while not getting kneecapped by the politics of the short term. Um, our long term, as many of you know, uh, is, is uh, kind of upward. Um, for those of you who think we're in a boom, um, we're not. This is the new normal. If we're going to meet our projections for uh, Metro's 2035 docu uh, uh, projections um, uh, in building, we will have to build roughly at this rate for the coming next few decades, just to take care of the people that we're, uh, that we're giving birth to, let alone the ones that are moving here. And that's probably not even taking into account um, things like the tree die-off that's hap happening in the Southwest. If you look, delve into the demographics a little deeper, you'll notice that Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, that our in-migration rates have doubled in the last five years. Uh, uh, from those states, so I think that there's something going on uh, that we're going to see a lot more of. So, um, so what I want to do tonight is, uh, you know, these guys are going to get a lot of chance to talk about the short-term issues in the coming forum, so I really wanted to try to focus them on the long term. How will each of them design the Portland of the future? Because if we don't design our growth, our growth is going to design us. Um, so welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're just going to jump right into the questions. We'll let them do a concluding statement. Um, but what I wanted to begin with is um, the city that we see uh, growing up around us right now was actually really designed in 1981 with the, for, with the last comp plan. Um, what do you think we got right and what did we get wrong? Do you have any well, you jump? No, go ahead. Can you start? Jump in. <coughs> Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you to this packed house uh, full of design, architecture, and planning wonks. Of course, in Portland, we draw a packed house for this kind of conversation. So really, really good to see all of you here tonight for a really important conversation about the future. I'm Jules Bailey, and uh, in 1981, actually, my father, Bob Bailey, was working for Will Martin at the time and uh, had a chance to uh, be involved in some of those early designs, especially around Pioneer Square and uh, other things here in, in the city that some of you will recognize that name. Uh, the fact is, is that we have a city that is at a remarkable turning point right now. And while you're absolutely right in your premise that we, a mayor has to think for the long run, the mayor also has to think in the short run because the short run is also what matters to everyday people, whether they can afford to live in their homes, whether they can make rent, whether they can put food on the table or find childcare. Those are the, the realities that people who live in the buildings that we build face every day. So as we think about what does the long run for Portland look like, when we think about comp plans and when we think about the built environment and design, we have to recognize that they're built for people. And ultimately, uh, that is what good design and good policy does, is creates beautiful, functional, and livable space. And I think we've been good in this town at doing that in the past, but we are now reaching a tipping point where we're not necessarily a medium-sized city anymore. We're now on the verge of becoming a major city. We've got a million new people moving here. We've chosen not to grow out, which is the right decision. So how do we then grow in and up? And how do we do that in a way that maintains the character of what made this city great and that makes it a place where everybody can continue to thrive. Those are a lot of the questions that I'm focused on and that I think that everyday Portlanders are focused on as well. You know, that's, that's a provocative question. And I wish I had a really quick and pat answer for you, and I do not. Um, but it's one I'm going to think on. Uh, uh, here, here's what I know. Uh, thinking back to 1981, I was graduating from high school. Uh, the largest industry in our state was forest products. Uh, the tallest building at the time, I believe, was called the First Interstate Tower. It's now the Wells Fargo Building. Uh, the first large-scale condominium project had just come online in the Coin Tower. It was extremely controversial. Uh, a guy who designed teapots designed the largest public works facility in the state of Oregon. 
Um, and we, we're wondering 35 years later why it's the only skyscraper in downtown Portland that needs to be completely rehabbed. Um, here, here's the way I see it. I, I guess I don't vary tremendously from Jules on this, uh, except you know, that I would say you know, there will be a time in this community's history going forward where we have to acknowledge we can't quite see the future. The city that exists today is fundamentally different than the city that existed in 1981. And I don't think anybody could have anticipated the growth, the number of people moving here, the amount of displacement that is currently taking place. I don't think people in 1981 would have considered gentrification a bad word. They would have seen it as a desirable outcome. And now we're understanding that there are implications for that kind of growth. So as Jules and I sit here tonight, the long-term vision, since this is a visioning process over a few beers and a glass of wine and we're being casual about it, it's how do we anticipate the next million people that come here and maintain the livability of this community. And it's not just about design and planning. There's a lot more that has to go into this. Affordable housing, how we employ people, what kind of infrastructure we need, what about the schools, what about roads and bridges, what about the transportation systems of the future given that we can't expand the roads or the highways or anything else. It's, it's a fundamentally different way of thinking, but there's a lot of things we can't anticipate. For example, the way transportation works may be fundamentally different in 25 years of Google. You know, if their vision turns out to be the truth, things are going to be different, and that implies differences in the way we plan. What did we do right? We created the metro regional government. So we have a regional approach to planning and urban development. Uh, what did we do wrong? We didn't actually live up to the planning process. We were supposed to create jobs and housing close to proximity so that the transportation systems wouldn't be mucked up the way they are now, where we have jobs created in eastern Washington, excuse me, western Washington County, and all the affordable housing moving farther to the east in Multnomah County, which is creating living trans, uh, transportation as well as affordability issues going farther. Jules, you have anything you want to add? I think we can move is on to the next question. Okay. Uh, well, my next question is, uh, uh, whichever you be, which, uh, which, whoever is going to become mayor uh, is going to uh, basically come into office with a new comp plan um, that's going to council probably in April. And I'm curious uh, uh, about, uh, it's taken over 4,000 comments, six public meetings, 13 months of deliberations. Um, what do you think are the merits and failings of the draft so far? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that since, and, and by the way, I want to acknowledge somebody else in the room. Dave Shore, where, where are you? Uh, uh, David Shore in the back is also running for mayor, and he's not on the stage tonight, but I hope at some point tonight, maybe when we're mingling around afterwards, you'll, you'll have a chance to meet Dave and talk to him and hear his vision as well. Um, what I've heard about the comp plan, I've, I've spent a considerable amount of time meeting with neighborhood associations, and I'm just going to be honest, I don't want to discredit the work that people have done or discredit the work that the city or the city council has done or discredit any of the work that has gone into the planning process. But when you have neighborhood associations with such vehemence and in such broad numbers saying that they don't feel like they were heard in the comp plan, that's a problem going forward because this is our plan about our community and it lays the foundation for where we're going to make investments, where we're going to deploy resources, what our policies at the city level are going to be in support of that comp plan and if you have neighborhoods that represent all of us collectively in our 95 unique neighborhoods saying that they don't feel like their input was included, that is not a mandate. And it's going to make it very, very hard, in my opinion, to be able to support the plan if people say, hey, you asked me on my opinion, I gave you my opinion, you didn't take it, it wasn't, yeah, it's your plan, City Hall, it's not my plan. That's going to create some problems. So I would hope we would slow down and take into account some of the criticism and ideas that the neighborhood coalitions have put forth to the City Council. I hope they would extend the timeline and hear some of the commentary that the neighborhoods have put forth around density, around parking, around transit, around the need for parks and recreation, the need for walkability, the need for safety on the streets. 
Um, I, I just hope, you know, given that this is our vision for the yeah, for decades in the future, I really hope that we spend some time to slow down and make sure that the public is still with us in this plan. So I hear the word comp plan and I start to get a little excited. So for those of you uh, who don't know, I, I have a master's in urban planning, which is like an architecture except for people who can't draw and, or pay attention to details. Uh, but <laughs> no offense to any other MERPs out there. Uh, but it's been, a, uh, it's been a fascinating process to watch. I had a chance to go down and testify in front of City Hall uh, on part of the camp comp plan process uh, on the need for uh, increasing density, on increasing floor heights, and making sure that we have a city that reflects the needs that we're going to have uh, going forward. But I want to tell you a little bit about a, a personal experience, and that is when I came to Multnomah County, we had a uh, rural area plan in process for an area of my district in Sylvie Island. And when I started, the county came to me and said, all right, well, we've got this, this plan underway, and it's basically done. We just need some sign-off uh, from the folks on Sylvia Island, and we are good to go. Well, that wasn't exactly true. Uh, and in fact, it turned out that there had not been a lot of process with the folks out on the island. Uh, we had not had a robust community conversation about how do we protect farmland that we love uh, that is so close to the urban area and preserve something that people have worked so hard for. So we pressed the reset button and we went back and we said, how do we make sure that we have a plan that works for everybody? And over the course of the next year, we only added another year onto the process. And with the assistance of my crack staff, Christine Lewis, who's in the room tonight, uh, and many, many, many meetings at the Grange Hall uh, later, uh, we came up with a consensus document that met the needs of the community that was unanimously supported out there uh, and that had buy-in uh, from all of our technical and planning staff as well. And so I think the, the, the evidence really is in how do you make the case and how do you engage? Because the fact is, we, there are going to be tough conversations. We are going to add a million people. We are going to need to increase density. We are going to need more units. We are going to have to have a conversation about how we grow in and up. But we have to do that in a way where we're meeting people where they are and having a conversation that acknowledges the fears and concerns about people's neighborhoods and their desire for livability. And I think that through engagement and dialogue, we can come to a consensus there that doesn't knee jerk back to a not in my backyard mentality, but that actually articulates why we need a city that's going to work for everybody and includes the kinds of things that make Portland a livable place and doesn't stifle the success that we've created. So I asked these guys to, uh, I, I posed some questions and I asked them for some specifics on um, uh, places that they thought were, uh, were successful. So I asked them, what intersection or street uh, in Portland most epitomizes the success of Portland design and planning in recent uh, years? And they both chose the same thing, the transit mall. Um, Good choice. <laughs> so real quick, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I want to spend time to show the differences between you guys. But uh, we're, we're uh, brilliant. Uh, you're totally brilliant. Um, um, uh, so real quick, what do you think makes this so much more successful than other places in downtown? Aside from, you have to take the transit off of it because, I mean, it's unusual for having transit. So what, what really has crystallized its success as an urban design? Well, it's not so much, uh, transit is obviously important, but that's not why I chose it. The reason that I chose it is that the transit mall does an incredible job of serving every kind of Portlander that wants to use it. It's got to be functional and accessible for an incredible variety of uses. For people uh, that, that want to get to the city, that want to get out of the city, people that uh, are, are mobility challenged, different road users, there's an enormous number of different kinds of people that need to use this space and it functionally works really really well and one of the reasons it works well is not just because of the seamless integration that you have in different modes of transit but because you have public private partnerships that take care of the bricks here in in the middle of the of the intersection because you have businesses that have invested in it you have firms that have spent a lot of time and energy making sure that it's functional there's a lot of people that have made a lot of their efforts go into making this a functional place that works for everybody, even if it doesn't seem like it on the surface. And that's one of the marks of a well-functioning system is that you don't often see the gears turning. Uh, but it really does for the transit mall. 
So uh, I, I want to build off that riff since we agreed on this, and I find that to be a good thing. It accomplishes multiple goals simultaneously. And in a broad sense, it's not just, again, about design, and it's not just, again, about planning. It's about economic prosperity. It's about walkability. It's about livability. It's about community. It's about public art and culture. Uh, it, it's the core of our urban area, and it actually looks like a forest. I think that's remarkable. And thinking bigger about what it meant in the beginning when they created this mall, and, and Jules and I both latched onto this because they renovated it, so we were able to use it as a recent example. Uh, but when it was created, uh, it was also created around a large public space, Pioneer Square, which has been sort of the central focus point of the downtown core. And also, the folks who ran the city back at the time had a broader economic vision. And a lot of work went into thinking about not just the design and the planning and the aesthetics, but also what are the anchors that hold it together. And of course, we got Nordstrom to come here from Seattle and open a significant uh, operation here, which then leveraged other business opportunities. The thing I like the most about the downtown mall is it's large in that every building around is large, but it doesn't feel that way. You can stroll down the mall and still walk by individual store fronts or visit uh, the, the coffee shops or go to a restaurant or whatever, and it, it has a smaller community feel to it. And so for that reason, I loved it. Uh, I would have put as a second choice Decom Triangle in Northeast Portland. I don't know if people here are familiar with that. There's probably some people from the neighborhood. Uh, but they took an older business district, renovated it. They put new businesses in. It's walkable. It's livable. It's thriving. It's family friendly. It's kid friendly. And so they, they've created a community center in a place where previously uh, those opportunities didn't exist. And, and I like the fact that they reused the architecture that they had in place. And there's many, many opportunities across the city of Portland to do that. Do we get to say second choices? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes. Let's, let's move on to some place we want to improve. Uh, I'll, I'll be very, right, very, I'll be, very, I'll be very brief. Very quick. A little bit of a, of a different riff. Uh, I had actually thought about being a little bit provocative and putting the city repair sunflower at the intersection of Yam Hill and 33rd in inner southeast Portland. Uh, I grew up about two blocks from there, and I remember what it was like when I was growing up. Most of the houses that were around it were either vacant or were drug houses. And we had bars in our windows growing up. Now, the neighbors came together. They took ownership of that intersection. They painted it, and they made that together with a transforming Belmont something to be proud of. That's an incredible story of what we can do together as a community, but it also is an illustration of that's an area that I can no longer afford to live in. My wife and I bought a house last spring. We put in 10 offers in inner southeast hoping to stay in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and it became pretty quickly clear that we'd never be able to afford it. We love where we ended up, uh, but that is, I think, emblematic of how a community can come together to make a place better, but that also means that we need to make it a place where people can still live. Okay, this is uh, Jules' pick for a place he wants to fix. Great. So uh, this is 122nd and Powell. And this, I have to confess, uh, this is an old photo because if you had a current photo there, it's actually already starting to transform a little bit. The, the Oregon legislature, in a session that I was part of, put millions of dollars into this intersection as well as partnering with the city of Portland. It was a great state-local partnership. But it's just one example of the unsafe intersections that we have throughout uh, East Portland. And where, as we are in investing in making this a better intersection that's more walkable, bikeable, safer for people, we need to transform up and down these corridors in East Portland so that the people living in East Portland can have access to the same kinds of safe transportation, communities, public transit that everybody in Portland has. That's where we need to be focusing a lot of our effort so that we can bring that equity to everybody. So I kind of want to push on that a little bit because um, um, we've been kind of using the same kit of parts in Portland for a long time. We're really good at, at, at fixing up old streetcar neighborhoods. East Portland's a whole nother thing. You know, uh, wide swaths of farmland that were subdivided over a period of time, uh, huge, uh, basically state highways rolling through. Um, what, is, what would you bring, what, would, what tools would you bring that would substantially change these places, in, not, not into just nice intersections, but actually into places of commerce? 
Well, first of all, I wouldn't discount the, the need for nice intersections. I, would, I mean, I would start there because particularly for lower income communities, when you've got to walk and take a bus and then take two transfers and it takes you two hours to go to the grocery store and come back and you're trying to do that as a single parent, that's a huge burden on folks that are out there. So you do need safe, easy ways for people to get around, especially for people who might not have the money to buy gas all the time or make their car payments. That's a really important part of having good transportation infrastructure that's out there. But beyond that, we also need to make these thriving business areas. And when we talk about what we need to do as a community when we're growing in and up, some of that is going to mean investments in these corridors that make these places that are uh, amenable to small businesses. We look at some of the work that's going in on Foster out to 92nd. We look at some of the uh, corridors out by Monta Villa that are starting to change. That's not as far out as this is. But we are now seeing investment going farther and farther east. We need to encourage that. And the streetcar corridors that we're building on now are a legacy of investment that was made in this city 100 years ago. We can be making some of those same kinds of investment in these areas of the city that create the kinds of vibrant neighborhoods that I think a lot of pe Portlanders want to live in. May, may I riff off this, Randy? Sure. Uh, back in 2008, then Speaker of the House Jeff Merkley, now U.S. Senator, uh, then Mayor Tom Potter, and I, as Multnomah County Chair, authored and convened the East Portland Action Plan. And the key ingredient of the East Portland Action Plan was to stop talking about the need. The history here, of course, is that East Portland was annexed by the city of Portland for Multnomah County, and the promise was made, and we're going back decades now, that the same level of service delivery would exist east of 82nd as exists west of 82nd. That was transit, economic opportunity, access to parks. Okay, I'm, I'm, you no, get no, the no, point. I, I, uh, speak so, closer to so the microphone. The, but the, the, oh, I'm sorry, the point, the point was uh, that we didn't want to have another study about the need for services in East Portland. We wanted an action plan. And a group of citizens from East Portland took ownership of it. They convened and they came up with a series of actions. And I'm very disappointed to say that while some of those actions were realized, the vast majority went on the shelf and were ignored. And so one of the things that I have said, and there's still people very actively involved in the East Portland Action Plan, I don't know if anybody is here tonight who still is, uh, we've got to take that report off the shelf and stop talking about it and start ticking through it. The people east of 82nd deserve the same service delivery that people west of 82nd have. We cannot call ourselves a full city until that takes place. So I applaud Jules. I applaud, I mean, the, the, you, know, you, you wanted us to find differences, but I want to applaud him for acknowledging that and being a great representative for East Portland because this is, this is a key issue. And while we're talking about these grandiose plans for the city of Portland, let's not forget there's a lot of people in this city who still don't have streets, they don't have parks, they don't have transit, they don't have walkability, they don't have public safety. And so it, it's a so very important thing to talk about. what's your recipe for investment about. without gentrification? All right. Uh, since you asked, I'll tell you the answer. The recipe for investment without gentrification is multifaceted. Number one, you need affordable housing in the community that's prioritized for people in the community. You know, you're going to ask us later about some of these other great neighborhoods in Portland, like the Rose Quarter or whatever. Let's not forget how they got there. We need to create a beachhead in communities that are already expanding and are already being gentrified so that people who live there now can afford to live there. And if that means rent waivers, great. If that means more affordable housing, great. But it's also about the way the city and the PDC contract and it's about the way they procure. We've got to make sure that people who are impacted by the investments we make around growth and expansion and economic development are actually participating in that growth in that economic opportunity. So I'd like to see changes to our procurement system. I'd like to see changes to our contracting process. I'd like to see more transparency in the PDC around how general contractors are using people in the community. I'd like to see more workforce development from people in the community to have access to higher wage, higher paying jobs so they can afford to live in the community rather than being forced out or moved out. Jules, any, any differences? 
I would add to that. So obviously gentrification is, is one of the primary paradoxes and challenges of economic development problems. How do you improve a place which increases demand without then making that place more expensive and less accessible? Well, part of that is that you give people an equity stake in that area. So yes, it's about economic development. Yes, it's about making sure that we have affordable housing. Yes, it's about uh, workforce development. It's also about home ownership. It's also about giving people a chance to be able to rise with a neighborhood, to be able to cash in on some of those benefits. And that means having a strategy that isn't just about making rental units that people can get, but transitioning people into, a, into an option where they can own their own home. And sometimes that's a detached single family unit home. And sometimes that may be in a multifamily structure or as part of a, like a, a multifamily REIT that people can buy into. You've got to find ways to make people have that stake because right now condos are a bit of a dirty word. These people sort of picture you know, the boxes in the sky that are unaffordable to anybody. But in a town that's going to be denser and accommodate more people, we need places that people can afford to buy and be able to uh, grow with the community. So Ted um, uh, selected as a place, oh, sorry, that's a terribly pixelized uh, slide, but uh, um, uh, as a place that he would like to improve is the Burnside Cooch Couplet and the Hawthorne uh, Madison Couplet. So uh, I, I would take all the Inner East Side couplets and, and group them together here. Uh, Burnside Cooch, uh, Morrison, uh, Belmont, uh, 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 Hawthorne, Madison. Um, there, there's a lost opportunity here for the city of Portland. A anybody who commutes in that area regularly, anybody who works over there, and, and Jules and I have both you know, been over there with the county facility, uh, anybody who does business over there knows that while it is part of the core of our city, the reality is those transportation corridors are more like freeways. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to cross, it's not particularly walkable, uh, it doesn't have the vibrant, robust, walkable, you know, smaller scale business district that you'd expect from a core area. Uh, I would like to see investments take place there that are commensurate with the light rail investments that we've already made, the streetcar investments we've already made in that community to make it more scaled to what people need in terms of walkability, in terms of livability, in terms of small-scale commercial, as opposed to what they are now, which is you know, high-speed, they're high-speed throughways into the downtown area. Um, I invited them to, um, uh, to pick a couple of larger infill buildings that best epitomize the successes and the failures of the uh, city's design code. And Ted, you selected um, uh, the developments in Lloyd District. Yeah, and, and I'm not picking on any particular architectural elements here in, in all my, co I'm not an architect, I don't pretend to be an architect. So if, if you think the, uh, what I'm really talking about is the space. This is high density, urban, large scale, uh, yet the Lloyd District in its redevelopment still managed to make it a thriving and livable uh, area. It's walkable, it's bikeable, it's safe to cross the streets. Uh, there's artwork, uh, there's greenway, uh, there's places to pause and reflect. It doesn't feel like a hustle bustle deep urban cavern that you see in so many parts of so many cities in America. It actually feels like a neighborhood that's designed for high scale business operations and housing. Jules? So this building here, uh, Indigo building, ZGF, and I think is mirrors some of the other projects that have been around town, but does an incredible job of accomplishing a number of things at once. And that's sort of a theme with me in good design. I like seeing things that accomplish a number of things at once. One of the things that it does is it incorporates uh, residential living uh, with businesses. Uh, it does so right in the core of the city. It does so in a way that uh, the neighborhood actually uh, was sad when, when some of the stories were cut off uh, the top of it uh, because it did fit so well uh, within the design. It's got great ground floor presence that's revitalized that neighborhood. We've got Lardo in at the bottom, and which I frequent probably a little too much. Uh, and it's also a beacon for sustainability for our city. It doesn't matter to me how many megawatts or kilowatts those windmills on the top generate. The fact is, is that they are a striking symbol on our skyline that this is a city that is committed to 
confronting climate change and to having a sustainable built infrastructure. I think it's a beautiful building. It accomplishes a lot of things, and I think it's very much in character uh, with where we want to go. So I want to, um, um, they gave some other slides, but I kind of want to move our discussion along. So the, the toolkit that you would have as mayor is basically being able to choose the bureaus. Um, I'm curious if uh, uh, what bureaus you will hold on to that could actually affect the development of the city. You want to start, Jules? Well, I'll have a, I'll give you a very short answer, and it's probably not going to make you very happy. And then we'll see uh, what Ted has to say. Equally, uh, <laughs> I am not committing on any bureaus prior to being elected mayor because I think one of the most important things that the mayor does uh, once he or she starts in office is to sit down with the city council and find out what their strengths and weaknesses are, what they like, what they don't like, how to partner together uh, as, uh, as a mayor. Because a good mayor is not an executive or a manager. A good mayor is somebody who's a leader and a coalition builder. And I think to get out front and say which bureaus you're going to take, I think uh, hamstrings you from the very beginning. So I'll, I, I will take a slightly different tack, but I, I largely agree with, with Jules' uh, talking points here. Uh, I will take the police bureau. I believe as mayor, it's a responsibility of the mayor to take the police bureau. It's a very important bureau. It has citywide implications. There are a lot of issues related to law enforcement and public safety in this city right now. And the reality is that other mayors in the past have tried to delegate that authority to other commissioners. It still comes back to you as the mayor. People look to you as the person who is ultimately responsible, not only for the safety of the community, but also the conduct of law enforcement in the city. And so I will keep that. The rest of Jewel's answer is exactly right. The question is, how do you leverage the experience and the expertise on the city council and also, you have to think about the groupings of the various bureaus. I think it's like a puzzle. It's important to understand how, you know, w with our form of government, whether you love it or hate it, the reality is the government is siloed. Commission form of government creates silos. Certain bureaus must interact and work effectively together and communicate effectively together and have uh, strategies that are in combination. And so if I'm mayor, I'm going to give a lot of thought not only to the expertise and the experience and the leverage that's on the council. I'm going to think about how best to group those bureaus in my assignment of the bureaus. But I don't think I can uh, uh, realistically say that I would assign the police bureau to somebody else. So what about the Portland Development Commission? It's gone through, it's probably, there's probably no bureau that's gone through more significant change in the uh, last what, three administrations in terms of its, its operations. I mean, basically it's been changed from a development agency into a uh, economic development arm, um, but has moved also from a development agency to basically a, a real estate agency. Um, what, uh, uh, what do you think is working about the current develop, uh, Portland Development Commission? What would you change if it were your bureau, let's just say? Ted, do you want to start? Sure. sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. So you, you characterize two thirds of the issue. Um, it is a redevelopment agency. That is its history. That is its tradition. The way it allocates money has not changed, even though it has moved towards a CDC or an economic development agency. And under Mayor Hales, I would say it's even trying to change stripes again to become a place building organization. But the way it funds projects the kind of projects it funds, which tend to be large-scale, bang-for-the-buck projects, and the skill set in the agency have remained static. I don't think I'm offending anybody here, even people who work for the, the, the PDC, and there's some great people who work for the PDC, you will probably agree with me. So now the question is, what do we need it to be? Uh, first of all, uh, I, I won't bore you with the TIF cliff, but some of you here are developers, you're in the know. The agency's gonna have uh, problems issuing debt to be able to fund its operations going forward. And weirdly enough, uh, the agency is still acting like a commercial bank. The way it underwrites, the way it lends. Uh, my view is that the PDC should be deploying assets that you can't get at a bank for purposes that aren't 
bankable. So a couple of the things I'd like to see. Number one, I'd like to see rather than just the big scale redevelopment stuff, I'd like to see some small stuff. How about business districts? How about supporting small business? How about workforce development? Uh, how about small, uh, small business development loans? How about helping individual business districts do what they want through some entrepreneurial dollars? You know, we created this sort of large redevelopment agency and we de-emphasize business, business improvement districts. And I'd, I'd like to see us do both in parallel, redevelopment plus smaller scale business improvement districts. Uh, and then finally on this, transparency is a huge issue to me. And uh, while I don't blame people individually at the PDC, I do blame City Hall for not being more aggressive and demanding the same kind of transparency and accountability around contracting that City Hall uses for the rest of its contracting operations. Um, one thing, is everybody here okay in the back? Okay, good, good. If uh, not, you've got the bar closer to yeah. you and consider it, it, yourself it, yeah. lucky. <laughs> If you, if you can't hear, just wave at us because you have to, get to keep the There's people closed. up here who'd love to trade seats with you. They'd rather be closer <laughs> to the bar. Okay, Jules, PDC. Well, so this is actually an area where I think we differ a little bit. Uh, Portland Development Commission, first of all, we really need to get back to basics here. The Tiff Cliff is exactly right, but tax increment financing is at its core what? Tax increment financing is about taking freezing assets so you can use the increment of value that's coming in above a certain property tax level to invest in an area such that then it raises the value of that area so that everybody benefits when, when urban renewal goes away. And then you have public services that are funded. It's not to create a slush fund or for uh, a series of funds that are to be used uh, for a lot of different purposes. We need, to, if we're going to use TIF as a, as a tool, TIF needs to be about making targeted investments that increase property values and that make sure that that is returned back to the services from which those came uh, originally. And I think we've gotten away from that concept. However, PDC is naturally transitioning because of the history of tax income financing, and you're right, it's, it's transitioning into a real estate agency. And there's a lot of good things that PDC can do from a development perspective. And I do think PDC is staffed with incredibly competent people. And in fact, there's some great project managers uh, at PDC right now that are incredibly talented and I think would stand up to any of the project managers of the past. However, asking PDC to do things like business improvement districts, to ask PDC to do things like some of those neighborhood scale things uh, is a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. And that's why as mayor, I'm proposing that we actually create a new lead economic development uh, entity the Bureau of Small Business and Economic Empowerment that is based on a very successful model that Mayor Bloomberg used uh, in New York to great effect and that focuses on customer service for local small businesses, on providing those kinds of loans that people need, bringing in the business improvement district, folding workforce underneath that, and having a comprehensive service set for those businesses. Expecting a tax increment finance entity and a real estate entity to be able to do both those things well at the same time, I think is inviting disaster. So le the, good, finally, we have, we have some <laughs> variants. Um, <laughs> urban renewal areas only cover 15% of the geography of the city. So let's acknowledge that. The, the PDC's funding mechanism around TIF only works in 15% of the city. 98% of the small businesses in this city have five or fewer employees. So however you get to it, the reality is if you want to talk about an economic development agency, you've got to talk about how do you get broadly to all of the small businesses uh, in the community. Back in October, I proposed something similar to what Jules is proposing tonight, and I think he talked about this the other day as well, uh, which is an office of small business. Again, getting back to the structure of government, we have this siloed form of government, uh, and it has some interesting unintended consequences, one of which is if you want to expand a business, in this community, you must go to multiple bureaus to complete your permit and get your inspections completed. And the inspections are often duplicitous and or the inspectors from different bureaus disagree. And it leaves the business owner wondering what the heck just happened. I have a friend who's trying to open a business, uh, a restaurant, he's got two successful ones downtown, he's trying to open a third, he's waited over a year for his permit. 
He's wondering, will I get my permit? And meanwhile, the inspectors are arguing amongst themselves, city inspectors. And from his perspective, uh, he's like, hey, I'm the client. You guys go into a room and figure out your problem and then get back to me. Um, I also want to just acknowledge Commissioner Nick Fish. Commissioner Fish uh, has been working on just such a concept as what uh, Jules is discussing and what I'm discussing writ larger in terms of how do we right size no, that's not the right word. How do, we, how do we coordinate the various city programs, the funding mechanisms, the economic incentives? How do we bring all these things together in a way that makes sense? Because I, I think Jules and I, are, you know, while we may disagree on the details, I think we're in agreement uh, that the PDC, as a redevelopment agency, is struggling with what we in the community are asking them to do, what their skill set is, what their funding mechanisms are, what their underwriting protocols are, and what the city council is telling him to get done. So one of the things that has uh, sort of dropped away from the PDC and its uh, uh, sort of reconstruction, uh, redesign, has been urban design. And there's probably no greater example of this than the Burnside Bridgehead. This is a little collage of, uh, of photographs of the various projects. Jules had singled out uh, uh, the bridgehead, particularly the yard, Block 67, as, uh, as an example of a, of a bad large building. Um, but I want to talk about uh, sort of the larger thing that was going on here. There were many runs at the, at the bridgehead uh, that were made um, in, in the 2000s. Um, and then uh, the PDC sold off uh, the individual parcels. Um, the first time that the designers and development teams ever met in a room was here um, for the last session we had at Bright Lights. That's the first time they'd ever met. There's basically, there's differing street um, conditions uh, or street design, uh, street furniture design on these buildings. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen on the ground. There are their entrances. We don't know what's going to exactly happen in the middle. Um, it's, um, you know, it's an interesting uh, thing. Now this is, is an example of basically urban design kind of falling away. Um, I was lunching with an architect, John Schleining, um, a few days ago, who was telling me um, that during a, a lot of his tenure, the PDC would fund, he, his firm alone had a couple of urban design contracts a year. Um, I can remember during the time that I've written here that they were constantly generating urban design um, uh, studies of different neighborhoods in, in downtown and different districts. Something like this would not have ever happened. How will you bring urban design back into the conversation in a serious way in Portland? So you mentioned the Burnside Bridgehead project, which I had put up there as an example. Uh, the yard building is an example of, I think, one of the poor buildings. It's not that I don't think that we should have uh, larger infill buildings or that we don't need to go uh, up. And I think there's definitely an argument to be made that at the Burnside Bridgehead, having a building that mirrors sort of the skyline across from it is a potentially good idea. What I think it's an example of is that design review is broken and that some projects sail through design review and other more questionable projects get hung up in design review. And you've got a building there that's come out very different uh, from what went through design review. It's, it's much darker. It's, it's this sort of big monolith that's there. That's not what people thought that they were getting. You've got to have predictable, consistent design review processes that are equally applicable to everybody where people know the rules of the game, it's easy to navigate, and you can be clear on what you're getting out of that. If you don't have that, then what's the point of even having standards and how you have a city with design? You've got to have that consistent process. And so that's one of the things that we have to start with is fixing the broken design review process. Okay. So, uh, so let, let me build on the theme. And uh, once again, I'm going to disappoint you all by not having a debate with Jules. I, I've heard about the design review process now for the last, I don't know, six years. Um, you know, I, I spoke to an, you know, affordable housing is clearly an issue in this community. We're, we're you know, the second least affordable city in America for school teachers and firefighters and tradesmen and tradeswomen and people who, who work in uh, the hospitality industry, including people who work right here uh, in this facility here tonight. And so I started poking around. What's, what's, you know, why do we not have affordable housing? And this design review process was called out to by a developer who said he'd spent over a year in design review. 
He'd had his architectures and his engineering and his design team come back to Portland five times, because they are a company that, that does large-scale projects. They'd spent over $140,000, and they were still arguing over FAR, floor area ratio, you know, the, the basic question of what's the thing gonna look like. And I don't want to cast dispersions on the people on the Design Review Commission. They are volunteers, are community volunteers. I don't know any of them personally, but I'm told they're good people and they're smart and they know their stuff. Uh, but the standards that Jules is, talk Jules is talking about um, are antithetical to cur current city ordinance. The current city ordinance around Design Review has two specific provisions that give the Design Review commission flexibility and discretion around design. So I think one of the debates that's going to have to happen in this community is do we want more of a standardized set of principles around design review and you come in with your architectural stamps and say, I met all 50 of your principles, now give me my building permit. Or do we want to continue to have a process like the one we have today with some discretion? and an opportunity to slow down the question around aesthetics and design. I'll tell you where I'm leaning, and I think I heard Jules say this, I, I won't speak for him. Um, I'm leaning more towards a standardized process because it's particularly onerous on the affordable housing side of the equation. There's another part of the process that's broken that I wanna call out as well. Uh, and you know, since I'm, I'm on the rant about affordable housing, uh, there is a very well-known nonprofit in this community. I won't embarrass them because they didn't give me permission to talk about them. But they have a lot on which they are legally entitled and it is zoned for two buildings, two houses. They are trying to build two single-family houses at a very affordable level, 20% MFI for those of you who, who, who care, 10 to 20% MFI. They went through the permit process and now the Transportation Bureau has tagged on an $80,000 transportation improvement fee to an affordable housing project designed for people with very low income. They're told to expand the street, finish out a cul-de-sac, put in sidewalks, put in curb cuts, put in lighting. And while those are all important things to a development, I think we have to ask ourselves a question is our failure to adequately fund transportation something that we should be foisting onto the building process, particularly as it relates to affordable housing? In my opinion, the answer is no, and that we should make exceptions for affordable housing in that regard. Okay, neither of you guys actually answered my qu question. Well, what was your question? Uh, uh, be more specific. And, and but they pretty, were great pretty, answers. It's pretty easy to, they were. They were there great was great answers, answers uh, to the wrong uh, question, to, to apparently. A different question. Uh, yeah, okay. What my was question, question is really about urban design which, uh, and, and the city's role in that, which yeah. used to be proactive and is increasingly left to the exigences of, of, of the developers and, and, and uh, the, per, the permitting process. Oh, you're, you're asking the visionary question. I'm asking about how uh, uh, you would reassert urban design into the conversation about Portland development. We have a lot of development going on. The city is not being proactive about the design of it at street level, how it's fitting together uh, um, in the same manner that it once was. All right, I'll, t I'll take a wild shot at this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and remember the context, we're sitting here, we're drinking beers, we're having a nice <laughs> glass of wine at Jimmy Mac, and we're having an informal conversation. So I don't uh, hope I read tomorrow that you know, Ted Wheeler's plan for mayor is X, because that's, that's not what we're doing tonight. We're brainstorming. I believe the mayor has a unique opportunity to establish vision for the city, not by directing the vision, but by maybe encouraging and fostering a conversation around vision. For example, in your questionnaire that you sent us, you'd ask us, what would you do about the Rose Quarter? What would you do about the post office? What would you do about the Lloyd District? And as my head was spinning off of its access, I started thinking, you know what? Um, I think what a mayor can do is break us out of the bureaucratic mold that we're in today. And I will use the post office as an example. Uh, I asked a really silly question the other day because I honestly didn't know the answer and maybe most of you didn't either. You know, we're just in the process of acquiring the post office spot over by the Pearl District 
And my question was, have we already decided what we're going to do with it? Because it sounded when I read the articles in the paper like we had. Like there had been some grandiose process and people had decided what was going to be done. And then I learned, no, uh, that the city's bureaucracy and the PDC and other they have their ideas, but the community hasn't really chimed in. And I started thinking, where's the vision? I'm going to give you one vision. This isn't necessarily the right vision. But when we have a brownfield opportunity for a new neighborhood, why don't we think about how we leverage what's unique and what's special and what's part of our ethos? Let's talk about, for example, a sustainability in a green district. Imagine a neighborhood in this community where when we think about how we're going to build things, we use crass laminate technology from rural Oregon. We think about how we include energy efficiency. We put green roofs on all those buildings. We're close to the time now where I think we can require green roofs. It's a proven technology. It has multiple advantages. It's an energy efficiency saving tool. Imagine that every building in that district had a LEED standard or the equivalent of a LEED standard. And imagine that we also encouraged economic prosperity through job training, university participation in developing programs around green technology, uh, clean tech R&D, clean tech uh, infrastructure, renewable energy infrastructure and design. And what if we also use as an opportunity not to just have it be another expensive neighborhood for all of us white people, let's have it also include opportunities for affordable housing and including people who have been gentrified out and displaced in this community and bring them back and connect them with these educational opportunities, maybe through a Portland State University or a PCC, and include them in the job okay. training, include them in the <laughs> development of okay. this community. I'm, I'm answering the question. No, it was I a know, good but question. you're taking up a lot of time. I want to All right, never mind. Chance. Forget about it. Forget <laughs> I said any. <laughs> I appreciate the answer and I appreciate the vision. I think what you're identifying is a symptom of a larger disease, is that we have a fractured planning process. The left hand does not always know what the right hand is doing as we seek to solve multiple goals at once. I hear a vision about, well, we can have this am amazing eco district, it can be sustainable, we can have streets that work for everybody, housing that works for everybody, we can build workforce into it, it can be a beacon of small business and we can make sure that everybody thrives there. But the question is, how do we get there? How do we make that work? And how do we make sure that we don't have a design or an urban design process that is making things more expensive in a way that's digging us deeper in the hole? So when I think about the post office, for example, the post office property, we've got potentially some money to do things there, but not really enough to do something great. Meanwhile, we're kind of spinning our wheels out on Centennial Mills. What if we get some of that money in to make the post office property something really special? And we focus in on having an affordable community right in the core so that people aren't out at 122nd and Powell, what we're talking about, but people can actually live and work in the core and have access to that transportation. And I'll put my green building credentials up next to anybody. I'm very proud of my work in sustainability. But we have to be sure that as we're looking at the criteria that we place on the design work that we do, that we're not strangling the opportunities and making sure that we have housing and we have buildings that are neighborhood accessible and that everybody can work in. Because the fact is, when I look around this room, uh, the f we, this is not representative of the entire city of Portland. We need urban communities that work for everybody in Portland. Okay, so I'll, we're gonna... I'll, ju I'll just say this, Randy, if, yeah. I, if I may. One sentence, and one I sentence. promise, just one sentence. Okay. Okay, if we do nothing, the post office site that Jules and I have just discussed will be an extension of the Pearl District. It will be very expensive and it will be exclusive. And what I think you just heard up on this stage is both of us want a different vision and we're committed to seeing what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, I want to tee up some questions in the audience, but I'm gonna ask one that almost certainly will get uh, asked um, while you guys are thinking about uh, your good questions. So um, obviously the housing crisis is much in the conversation. Um, Easy to advocate for solutions are real estate transfer tax, inclusionary zoning. Um, do you support either of those? And if those cannot, don't fly at the legislature, what would you do well, let instead? Me, let me first say on the real estate transfer tax, that's now in the Constitution. We can't do a real estate transfer tax. It was a, a ballot measure that passed. Uh, I actually introduced a real estate transfer tax concept in the legislature mm -hmm. uh, several sessions in a row, but now it is, uh, <clears throat> now it is unconstitutional. 
I do strongly support inclusionary zoning. I think that's an important tool, and uh, I will be advocating for that tool. I think that's important. But it doesn't solve the entire problem of what we need for affordability in this town. So one of the challenges that we have <clears throat> is we have some single-family homes that are being torn down and being replaced with single-family homes that are extremely expensive. That doesn't help build out the number of units that we need. People ask me, do you want more affordable housing that's accessible to 30% lower MFI? Do you want more affordable housing that's available at 60% MFI? Do you want more market rate housing? Do you want more owner-occupied structures? And my answer to that is yes. We need across the board more units because we have a demand side problem that's coming in. And the challenge is, is that right now, some of the processes that we have, uh, and in fact, some of the costs that I believe you've run into yourself in this, uh, have made it such that when you go in and build an infill house, developers are having to build extremely expensive houses there to recoup the cost of what it took to be able to put that house there. So what if we took an idea out of the solar world? There are cities out there that have a, a program called One Day Permitting for Solar, which I also think we ought to do here. What if we had a streamlined and fast track process for permitting uh, for houses that met certain criteria, or if you were increasing the number of units, or if you were increasing the number of houses that were on a particular piece of property? You could make that faster, you could make it easier, and you could reduce those costs on the front end because it's as much about cost uh, as it is about anything. But the other side of the affordability conversation, it's about cost, but it's also about income. We've got to have more middle wage family supporting jobs in Portland. If we don't have that, then this will continue to be a place where young people go to retire. And that is not what we want. This isn't Portlandia, this is Portland. And we've got to have those local small businesses that are the engine of economic growth. Ted? Um, so let, let me build where, where Jules left off. And I, I think it would be a provocative and interesting statement if by the time the legislature came close to its conclusion in February, the two of us could come to an agreement on the housing package and testify jointly in front of the Senate because that's where the battle's going to be. So that the, I, I think Jules and I are big enough that we could find a way to do that, and I think that would send a very this important in, message from this community this is that on this issue, zoning. yes, on this issue, we're in, we're in agreement on the housing. Now, there's other issues. Inclusionary zoning, if it doesn't pass, I don't think we should you know, put our hands in the air and say we're done. There are things we can do around negotiating with developers. Uh, there are uh, you know, projects that Commissioner Saltzman has been working on. Um, uh, one of the ones he worked on, ironically, was on the east side of the Burnside Bridgehead. Uh, and whatever you may think about it, the reality is Commissioner Saltzman was able to leverage 56 more units of affordable housing by making some concessions around taxes and I think some height restrictions. And there's a model there to be looked at that could generate additional housing units. Uh, Jules is right. It's also about the, the demand side, making sure that people have access to jobs. I want to bore you with one statistic. During the height of the recession, I'm told there were 30,000 jobs in the state of Oregon that went unfilled for more than six months at the time when we had the highest unemployment rate in the United States. Why? We had the jobs, but people didn't have the skill set, the education, or the job training to be able to qualify for those jobs. We need to focus on education and job training to make that happen. And then last but not least, there's just renter's rights. And this is gonna come up as part of the housing bill as well. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, I, Jules and I were both at an event the other day, I think it was on Sunday, and we heard 300 people there, you know, about 50, 60 of them testified. There was a young woman there who had 100% rent increase from year to year, and she'd been a loyal tenant. She'd been there for a long time. Uh, we heard from other people who had kids who were displaced. Uh, you know, it seems to me that there could be some reasonable middle ground without passing any laws around standards at the local level around information about informing, about rent increases, about potentially uh, the notification period. And I've heard that there may be some legal precedent for being able to do that at the local level. So. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think there's lots of opportunities for us to, to act, Randy. Okay, who's got a good question? It has to be a question and it has to be short. <laughs> Chris? I want to go back to the, the comp plan discussion and the notion that some neighborhoods are not very happy. Uh, 
true that East Moreland has threatened to sue us, but at the same time, the Community Alliance of Tenants is cheering for what's in the comp plan. So is, is that a better outcome than if the Community Alliance of Tenants were suing us and East Moreland was cheering? Uh, so the, the meeting so, I was so referring to, I didn't quite get the question there, because uh, I want to make sure everybody heard it. So the idea is neighborhoods are not happy with how the comp plan is going. But I would contrast that with organizations like the Community Alliance of Tenants being very happy with where the comp plan is going. And is it better that we're making some neighborhoods uncomfortable and some of the folks who are not as well off are happier than if it were reversed? Okay, so let me try to, did everybody hear that? Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to reframe that or, or uh, restate it. So b basically, um, these guys think everybody's going to, you know, uh, uh, sing kumbaya uh, um, with their stu stewardship of the uh, of, of the comp plan. That all the they can come to some sort of consensus idea. There's already different organizations that support the comp plan uh, uh, as it's being written, and some that have their no nose out of joint. So. Who are you going to uh, 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 basically anger over it, and who are you not? Who are you really uh, uh, getting at? As Chris is saying, underprivileged folks, folks uh, working on affordable housing are pretty happy with the comp plan. Uh, others in the uh, more highfalutin neighborhoods aren't. How do you analyze the problem? First of all, you have to make sure that you are working, you have to work for consensus. It's, there's no substitute for working towards that consensus and having the kinds of conversations with neighborhoods that talk about why we have a comp plan process that addresses affordable housing. That said, you also have to have leadership. And the fact is, you need a leader who's going to say, we as a community, here's where we're going, and we have to have a process that's gonna result in a city that works for everybody. When I was down testifying in front of City Hall, on Goose Hollow, talking about the fact that we needed increased density, higher limits, that we needed more housing that was built in the core. It was a little uncomfortable. I had a group of people sitting behind me uh, who I believe were audibly hissing at some of my, uh, my answers. I decided not to turn around and see who they were or if there were any snakes behind me. Uh, but uh, it, it can be a challenging process. You can't please everybody all the time, but what you can do is engage fairly give people a reason to come to the table, have a conversation about why you believe what you believe, but at the end of the day, you've got to have leadership to get it through. And frankly, my track record in the legislature is about having to push a button. At the end of the day, you have to push the green button or the red button. There's no other button to push. And you can't make everybody happy with the button that you push. So you've got to talk about your principles, what you believe, show leadership, get as close to consensus as you can, and then push forward. I disagree. Um, I believe that there are certain entities in this community whose interests need to be represented by City Hall. And in that must include pot, I include our 95 designated neighborhoods. And I include in that pot the coalitions. And if City Hall is not going to listen to those organizations or take their input or respond thoughtfully to the comprehensive input they've given to the plan, then the city should be honest about it. And stop pretending that we have this neighborhood coalition system designed and set up to be responsive and reflective of the community's needs. In my opinion, um, we have not heard the neighborhoods. I have heard that from the neighborhood coalition leaders themselves and they have ex provided extensive testimony and extensive feedback, and I'm telling you, they don't feel like they were hurt. So again, it gets to governance. Uh, it's great to say you want to lead, but without a mandate, who are you leading? Another question. Richard. Uh, one of you mentioned Metro, and I think you both understand what an important role Metro plays growth management in the entire region. So from various positions, I've watched Metro many decades, and I've watched the city, um, which has several seats on the Metropolitan Policy Advisory Council, mostly composed of local government officials, uh, watched the city um, perform, uh, sometimes well, sometimes no leadership whatsoever. 
I'd like to hear you both talk about how you would see the city performing in that role. Okay, the question was uh, uh, how should uh, the city, how would you change the way the city is performing uh, in its role in the wider region, in the, in the metro regional government? Well, the fact is, is that the city of Portland has to engage in the wider regional conversation. Whether we're talking about affordability or homelessness or we're talking about job creation, Portland is a landlocked city. And we've got to be able to work with our partners uh, around us and have those relationships. You know, you hear sometimes talk about uh, where do we bring in, uh, do homeless people come in from other places in the country? There's not a lot of data to support that. But there is evidence that says they do come in. We do have a homelessness population that is a regional population uh, that we're serving. If we're not investing in the kinds of planning and processes that make the entire region affordable, then I think we're missing a fundamental part of the equation. I currently uh, am part of JPACT. I serve as the alternate Multnomah County on JPACT, the Joint Policy Advisory Council on Transportation, engaged in the Climate Smart Communities Pro Project, engaged in the creation of the Area Commission on Transportation, uh, and have been working very closely with Metro uh, throughout my career, including in the legislature. We need a city that understands that we are a regional economy and that is willing to engage as equal partners with uh, the cities that are around us and with Metro as a representative of that entity because if we take the position that Portland is uh, it's sort of our way or the highway or that we don't need to engage then we're missing a fundamental part of the solution. Before I was ever elected to anything uh, uh, then Metro Council President David Bragdon appointed me to be the citizen representative on MPAC, the Metro Policy Advisory Commission. And we went through a thorny urban growth boundary expansion process. And I sort of made a mental note that I didn't want to serve on MPAC anymore after that. However, I was then subsequently elected Multnomah County Chair, and I served in the role that Jules now serves on, on the Joint Policy Advisory Commission on Transportation, which is even more complicated, and it meets at 7.15 in the morning, or at least it did then. And, Metro, you know, they're great at many things, Andy, but making coffee isn't one of them, unfortunately. Um, the, the reality is this. Portland gets stuck for a lot of regional problems, and Jules correctly mentioned the homelessness issue. I would also describe a lot of the human services that Jules is engaged in at Multnomah County around mental health and, and drug and alcohol addiction issues and, and some of the public safety issues. But the reality is we haven't been as smart as we could be. And I, I don't want this, you know, I, I got to say this, you know, we've done more things really well than not, so I don't want anybody leaving thinking I'm being a downer here. But we missed the boat on a couple of things, and I mentioned it, I alluded to it up front. We're still putting housing over here and jobs over here. We have to think about urban planning and transportation and economic development and infrastructure and education all in the same package. And that regional table, it's unlike anything else anywhere else in the country where you have this opportunity to get everybody in the same room to talk about the vision. And uh, you know, I have confidence that whoever is elected mayor will continue to be a very strong regional voice in that room. It's very important that the mayor not just be focused on the city of Portland. The region needs to succeed because if the region doesn't succeed, Portland cannot succeed and vice versa. And uh, you know, I, I have always been a regional player and will continue to be so. So time was uh, uh, a, a lot of old planning walks uh, uh, really talk wistfully about the Goldschmidt days. Um, uh, of what a great leader he was. Um, I think those of us who came along a little later talk about Vera Katz very fondly now, though we might not have at the time. Um, you know, as, as, as Neil Goldschmidt once told me, he had 51% behind him all the time, <laughs> but not one percentage more than that. Uh, in retrospect, people tend to think that there was some sort of mandate there, and there wasn't. It was, uh, you know, the har hard work of, of, of leading, of cracking heads when you needed to, of seducing when you, oops, I shouldn't have probably used that word, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, that it's, uh, you know, there's many different aspects of leadership, but leadership has changed entirely in many ways. 
I mean, we're in a really different age uh, now where everybody is basically their own newspaper. Um, and so as we close tonight, because we need to close it down, um, I, I want you to talk about uh, how you will lead and how um, uh, you're going to sort of uh, surf these, uh, these waves of um, social media, of all the things that influence leadership now, how you would cast yourself as a different kind of leader than Vera or Neil was. Yeah, went first last year. Sure. Uh, you know, in, in summary, I'd just say this. The, the challenges are very different today. And while leaders of that era, whether they were elected leaders or business leaders or community leaders, uh, what they did that was really unique was they came together around big visions. They were not afraid to set large goals. And the conversation we had up here, I'm really glad Jules and I were in agreement on the transit mall. And that, you know, today people still talk about that 30 years later because it was the first national solution on stemming white flight, which was a major urban phenomenon across the United States. Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. It eviscerated neighborhoods, it eviscerated community institutions, it eviscerated public school systems, and Portland did something different and big through its visionary design and planning process. And the mayor has the ability to be not the director of that process, but the facilitator and the leader and the convener and the pusher of that process going forward. And that's where I see the great opportunity, but it's not so much, you know, I, I, you know, I think things have changed a bit. It's also about managing the market impacts that are influencing our community today. And right now the evil twins are gentrification and displacement. And there's a great opportunity for either of us or, or David or any of the mayoral candidates to really have a leadership opportunity in this community. I think first we have to acknowledge that actually a lot of the challenges we face aren't that different today. When I was growing up in inner southeast Portland, I went to a middle school that was minority Caucasian. Inner southeast Portland was a heavily Asian community. Those families were gentrified way back in the 80s and pushed out uh, to the fringe. We've had a continuing problem with people being pushed aside and left behind. And I actually took this question, and I put it in front of a group of 14 leaders of color, and I asked them about this question. And you know what the response I got back was? Nobody here pines for the days of Neil Goldschmidt. We still have a problem where we have not addressed a fundamental part of our city, which is how do we empower everybody? How do we make this a city that works for everybody? And it's been a continuing and persistent theme in Portland. And I'm glad it's finally getting some airtime now, but it is not new. But I think it is absolutely right that Vera, Vera Katz, for example, I think shows something very important about leadership in this city. Vera Katz was Speaker of the House. And in many ways, being Mayor of Portland is more about being like a Speaker of the House. Because you aren't that executive. You have to build those coalitions. You have to empower your city council members. You have to approach it by counting your votes. Neil Goldschmidt may have been in that point of saying, I always have 51% uh, behind me. And I think, frankly, that speaks to the fact that you can't make everybody happy all the time and that sometimes you do have to have leadership. But it also means building the kinds of coalitions that you need to be able to move forward. That's the kind of leadership that I bring, the ability to listen, a successful track record of doing that in the legislature, and at the end of the day, of making the tough decisions that I think will make this city work for everybody, and I think that's the legacy we can leave. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, our good servers at Jimmy Max. Um, I hope... I hope to see you all on March 7th for uh, Gil Kelly uh, and hear a little comparative notes between San Francisco and here. And I want to thank Jules and Ted for being thank good you. sports, for being up here, and um, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. We thank sure appreciate it. Thank you all for it. coming. Appreciate thank it. You.